Greetings. In today's video, by popular request and probably against my own better judgment, we're doing an advanced Walker logic tutorial. It's more of a showcase of how I manage it. My method isn't necessarily the best. There's people that have more efficient methods, methods that don't use as many logic blocks. But I do think my method has the advantage of laying everything out in a way that it can all be seen and modified easily enough. Again, it's very convoluted logic, but we will get there. The first thing I have to make sure everybody knows about is how the clock works. In our instance, a clock is a series of XOR gates or OR gates. Not AND gates, I think, because AND gates have a weird property which might mess things up. But in general, a clock is a series of gates that have delay, duration, and pause so that they go in sequence. Now, you don't have to make them exactly how I do them because if you have them overlap their timings a little bit, you can use that to your advantage when making the walking animation. However, for starting out, I would prefer to stay where every gate is only active when none of the other gates in the clock are active. So as you can see, I, I hold down W and each gate activates and then deactivates when the next gate activates. And that's your ticking clock, really. This dictates the movements and the timings of each of the pieces of your leg. So how do they work? Well, the basics is that every single logic block in the clock, in the singular clock, has a the same duration and the same pause, where the primary rule is the pause is three times the duration, right? Because being four gates in the clock, you have to have four fourths in total. Duration plus pause has to be four fourths. Uh, so therefore, duration is one fourth and pause is three fourths. This is math. <laughs> then, of course, if you want to do a six block clock, then it becomes six sixths in total. Duration is one and pause is five because you add them together, you get six sixths, right? Uh, same for this clock. If duration is 0 0.5, then six sixths, um, like six over six of 0 0.5 is three which means that duration plus pause has to be three, which is why 0 0.5 duration and 2.5 pause makes three in total. Uh, just one more example is pause is three, duration is one. We have four block clock, which means that the sum becomes four, which is four fourths, right? The, the first one is very wonky with its numbers because it's not about the whole, like, the, the round perfect number. It's about the fraction, really. And, and so this middle one also has the same principle. It adds up to two, which, and then if you divide two into fourths, you get 0 0.5. And then if you take three of those fourths, you get 1.5. And the delays work very much the same way. The first one in every clock is always zero delay. And then the ne the other ones go up by either one fourth or one sixth. Well, in these cases, they just go up incrementally by one sixth, one by one step, right? So 0 0.35, 70 is two times 0 0.35, and 1.05 is three times 0 0.35, and so on. Zero, 1 point, uh, 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5. This is the multiplying the duration by the number of blocks that we're going up, right? 
and this one is uh, the the larger six digit the six lock clock is much the same it has the first one is zero 0 0.51 which is 0 0.5 times 2 0 0.5 times 3 is 1.5 0 times point 0 0.5 times 4 is 2 0 0.5 times 5 is 2.5 right so if you keep in mind the number of blocks that you want your clock to run on, then you can make a clock that's any number of blocks. You can make a 10 block clock, right? You can make a seven, five, three block clock. As long as you keep the rule in mind, you can decide how long your clock runs, how, how much time each tick takes, and how it works in general, depending on what you find necessary for the build that you're making. This is a slowed down version, just with exaggerated movements so that you can see what's going on easier. I've, so I've taken the, the clock, it's the same clock, I just repeated it twice so that it's more easy to see what the blocks are doing. And well, it's the same clock, but slowed down a lot. I've also color coded the logic gates. So the the pink goes to this servo, which is the topmost servo on the hip. The blue goes to this servo, which is the knee servo. And the red goes to the hinge, which is the ankle. This means that the clock ticks forward and activates each row independently. So the first row, second row, third row, fourth row. And these gates, as they are colored, activate in sequence all of the hinges and servos in the leg. Now, they have different outputs. The hinge is always gonna be at its maximum possible angle. Why? Because hinges are slower than servos at their maximum speeds, respectively. Therefore, I need the hinge to just go as far as it can go before it stops. Also, hinges are weaker than servos, therefore it doesn't really matter exactly where the hinge got, the pressure of the leg on the ground is going to assist that as well. Servos instead, I set mine all to 100 degrees, and then I use percentages in the blocks to make the servo turn to exactly what number of degrees I want. So if your servo is set to 100 degrees and you put a 0.2 input into the servo, then the servo will turn 20 degrees. So I have the first logic gate uh, in the clock goes to the first row, obviously. It activates the hip at minus 0.65 and it activates the knee at 90, which means that the first step is basically bend the knee forward. The second step instead is the XOR gate for the angle that just gets activated completely as much as it possibly can. The third step is 45 degrees backward for the hip with no bend in the knee and the last gate is, is 90 degrees in the knee, so the knee gets bent 90 degrees backward, and the, the ankle gets bent as much as it possibly can, the opposite way. This all gives this result, basically. Knee goes forward, leg goes down, and then back, and then the knee bends to bring it, bring it back forward. Right, then we go to the other leg and it's simply exactly the same, just shifted by two ticks of the clock. So where here every tick of the clock coincides exactly with the row that's behind it, that's getting activated. Here, if the first tick of the clock activates, the third uh, row activates of logic gates. I don't know if this is evident. But like it, when, whenever the first tick of the clock activates, the third row activates. Whenever the second tick of the clock activates, the fourth row activates. And then it resets to the first 
when the third row, when the third tick of the clock activates, the first row activates. Um, and here, as you can see, the color coded uh, servos and hinge, it's like they aren't turning the same amount of degrees every time, which is where the percentages come in very handy. And like especially the, the pink one, the hip joint turns different degrees at different times. And that's how you get a relatively complex walking animation because you can dictate exactly what turns when and how. Therefore, I can now pull out what is essentially the more complete version. This is all exactly the same logic. It's just it just has a sped up clock, right? It walks faster. One thing to note is because the logic in this block is exactly the same as the logic in this block. So it's like 90 is positive here, uh, one is po negative here, one is positive here, right? This means that you have to pay attention because all the hinges have to be in the same direction. The red arrows and the green arrows have to be in the same direction on either side of the body, right? But the servos get mirrored. So whereas on the left side of the body, this servo has a negative speed, on the, pos on the, on the right side of the body, this servo has a positive speed, which means that I can give it the same inputs on both sides. So I just get to copy and paste my logic and then just transfer over the inputs without having to worry about the inputs being reversed and the leg doing things it's not supposed to. My next example is going to be adding a layer of complexity on top of all of the previous. So this is chicken legs. A lot of you might remember him. As you can see, the servos are all static in position. So like the, the this leg starts off at zero degrees and this leg and, and this piece of the leg also starts off at zero degrees. And this also goes straight down, right? Therefore, chicken legs uh, starts off not in the position that he's supposed to. And therefore I have this logic gate, which is very helpful, which tells chicken legs where to move the servos originally into a position. So this is the idle stance of chicken legs, which is different than this. It's just activated by this logic gate, this purple one. Now you can just have it active all the time and then just deal with it the, the way I'm doing here. Or if it's an XOR gate and you have it active by default, you can feed the W key into it and then have it deactivate its idle pose if that helps. There are some walkers where I have done that because it does help. The clock works exactly the same as the other ones. Uh, nothing new there. It just one extra little thing is it has these two yellowish gates that get activated when I press W and these rotate the servo forward a little bit. Well, as you can see, like the, the principle is very same. The first row are these two blocks. This is the, hin the hinges on the leg and the hip. Uh, this is the first knee. This is the second knee. <laughs> yeah, this is why this is the more advanced example because it really is more complex just because I've added more servos and stuff uh, to the leg. And every single one of them has its own weird angle that it likes to go to. As before, the third gate activates the first row on the other leg and everything's just shifted by a little bit. And this is chicken legs walking animation. So just very briefly before I cap off, this is how chicken legs works in full glory, <laughs> you might say. Obviously, there's a little bit of a, between the prototyping stage on the, like how the logic works on the blue slab and how it actually works in, in practice. There's a little bit of tuning, how much strength the hinges and servos have, because you don't want to just rely on straight, on the suspension pieces. You want to rely on the strength settings of the hinges and servos to give you 
extra suspension. And then this is the primary example. If you notice, there's an extra set of servos in, in the hips because those just bend forward a slight bit to make the walking animation look more organic. But other than that, it's pretty much exactly the same as it was on the board. You just have to adjust it a little bit for each di different robot, depending on what munitions you're carrying, on what weight is on its shoulders, so to speak. Yeah, the other thing that might be worth noticing is the two distance sensors in, f in the front and in the back. Those are the ones that are angled 45 degrees towards the ground. Those are essentially activating gyros in order to stabilize the walker. You can obviously do that simply with, with a gyro stabilizer, but that means that you can't go up inclines or down inclines for that matter. And there you go. This has been my hopefully not too convoluted showcase of how I manage two-legged walkers or in general more complex walker animations. These are all concepts that you can expand on and make into as many legs as you want, really. It's not limited at all to what the narrow cases of implementation that I've shown. I hope it's been helpful. I hope you've enjoyed. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the future.